Good morning. Let's try one more time. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. If you would, please stand. We're going to start things off by singing a hymn together, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. had a couple of quick announcements I wanted to cover with everyone this morning, and most of these are found in your bulletin. Um, this week, the Romans study is going to take a pause. Uh, John is overseas right now, uh, but those classes will resume at normal times right after fall break. Um, Love Chapel Holiday Drive. Uh, this year, we are, uh, for Love Chapel, Thanksgiving and Christmas boxes, we're collecting money for cans of green beans. Um, our target is 650, and we're looking to purchase about 1,300 cans uh, with that money. If you'd like to give, the information is all there inside your bulletin. Um, we also have our Fall Fest coming up, October 22nd. That is going to be from 4.30 to 7, and we are looking for volunteers for that. So if that's something you're interested in, I believe there's a sign-up in the back, uh, or you can get with uh, Mackenzie, and she would be happy to get you involved in that. A um, couple other things I did want to touch on, women's trip to Brown County. That's not in the bulletin. That is going to be on November 5th from 10 to 5. And there's a sign-up with all of the information posted in the back here next to the Polar Express, as I understand it. Um, with that being said, I want to take a few moments here and introduce my sister, Elizabeth, who just led us, and she's going to continue to lead our singing this morning. And also, uh, my father is here on the piano, Ron Mari. He is going to be playing worship for us this morning, as well as delivering the message. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to let him play something at this time. Let's go ahead and take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship.
rise for our next hymn. song, if you'll call it that, for you guys, which I've heard is someone's favorite, so I'm happy to be sharing it with you today.
Thank you. Good morning. It is nice to be with you this morning. And I want to compliment you on your great congregational singing. You know, I have been playing the piano for worship services since Christmas of 1973. And I have, in all those years, seen in a lot of bulletins or uh, services of worship where they make a spot for special music. And I've always had sort of a love-hate relationship with that term because, in my view, the special music should be coming from all of you. That's what is really special about a worship service, is when the people of God can join together and lift their voices with strength. And you have to have a critical mass of people who are willing to do that on a Sunday morning. And you know what? You all have that. And I just greatly appreciate that. I plan the worship services at our church, and um, just by way of explanation, I don't normally ask a congregation to sing that much all at once. 
we uh, have a little bit different order of service where we have a hymn and some things happen and then another, another song and so forth. So if you got tired singing, thank you for continuing the effort and, and lifting your voice. We appreciate that very much. I am here today with my wife, Julie, that was not introduced to you earlier. And she and I have been together for 40 years now. And we have three children, David, you know, Elizabeth is our younger daughter, and our youngest daughter, Rebecca, was not here today because she's expecting twins any time now in the next few weeks. So keep her in your prayers. It's been kind of a rough go. Uh, these twin girls will be joining several older brothers, to say the least. So, um, and those two girls that are coming will be nine and ten grandchildren for Julie and me and they're the only two girls. All the rest of them are boys. So we're looking forward to fun days ahead. Well, um, again, I appreciate the invitation to come. I noticed that your bulletin cover shows me as the assistant professor of piano at Asbury uh, something or other. I want to clarify. I worked for a very short time as a music teacher at Asbury College when I was a student at the seminary, which is across the street there. And um, since 1993, I have been, well, 94, I have been at St. Mary the Woods College over on the other side of Terre Haute. And so I don't really have that connection with Asbury any longer, but uh, that is something I did in the past. So I have worked as a music teacher since November of 1977, so that's a 45 year anniversary I'm looking forward to here in a month. I was still in high school, in case you were thinking, wow, he can't be that old. I had a classmate approach me and ask if I would give her lessons, and I said, well, okay. And I, I've had private piano students ever since. And then all three of my children have continued to do things in music, and I've been very grateful to see that, and then to see them use those gifts in various ways in churches over the years. Back about 1988 or 89, I was feeling something of a call to ministry, feeling like maybe there was more than just playing the piano on Sunday morning. And so at that time, I did decide to pursue a Master of Divinity at Asbury Theological Seminary. But after being there for about a year and a half, I determined that actually God's call was in a more focused way involving music. And so I never completed that particular master's program and instead returned home and have worked in church as a planner of worship services, uh, an occasional preacher, and I'm always grateful for those opportunities to share some thoughts with folks. But uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea who I am and where I'm coming from. This morning I've got a uh, passage in Romans where we're going to start. Then we're going to look at a couple of passages from the Gospels, and we'll return to Romans at the very end. Now, I do teach in a college situation, so I'm accustomed to teaching for about 50 minutes, and I promise you that I will go no longer than that. So, I'm, I'm kidding, we're not going to go that long. <laughs> um, let's have a few moments of prayer before we begin together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this space in which we meet this morning. We thank you for the work, the resources that have gone into the renovation and the making it possible for people to come and to hear your word and to share in fellowship together. We now ask that you would move among us by your spirit to open the eyes of our understanding, open the ears that we have to hear your word, so that we may go forth changed, being doers of your word, and not just those who hear. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, our opening scripture, and I think we may have that for you, is from the book of Romans. And Romans, you know, is one of Paul's letter to the various churches. And I like Paul. I like reading Paul. He spells it out, or if he doesn't spell it out specifically, he gives you some really good food for thought. And this particular passage has been one of my favorites over the years. 
Romans 8, beginning at verse 31 in the second half of the verse. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And amen to that. I think that this passage has been a source of comfort and refuge for many of us as we go through life and face the trials and tribulations that come to us. And there are many passages that we could lift up of this nature. But where Paul likes to lay it out as a lesson and draw conclusions, we contrast that with the Gospels and what Jesus taught when he met with his disciples. And you know that he liked to speak in parables. And we like the parables too. How many of you in, were ever attending vacation Bible school or Sunday school and maybe you get these little um, cartoon folders that have the story printed out in a cartoon form and it makes it really easy to understand and to remember? And we find comfort and a source of strength in those as well. But I think where Paul will simply tell it as it is, Jesus sometimes puts his message in a little bit of a, a, a something to be unwrapped. The parables are much like mirrors that we can hold up to ourselves and look into them and get a sense of what's happening inside us. And this idea in the Romans passage that we just read together, that was something that was playing on my mind this past summer and then our person who regularly preaches at church gave a sermon on this text and a couple of weeks later it occurred to me you know there's another side of that issue if God is for us and it was are we for others because what I was always taught is that if we are in Christ Christ is in us the hope of glory and if that same spirit that dwelt in Jesus and raised him from the dead is giving us new life, then we have the same attitude about people that God does, right? We're for others. Well, if you've been watching the news, or even just driving down the interstate, you realize that sometimes we don't necessarily feel for other people, do we? Not if we're honest with ourselves. Well, with that thought in mind, I started thinking about some of these parables that Jesus taught. And you know, there's the parable of the prodigal son, which we love. We love that story, the prodigal son. So, so great that he's welcomed into his home when he finally comes to his senses and returns. But we shouldn't forget the epilogue of the story, where the older brother is incensed that the younger brother, who has been such a scoundrel, is having a party thrown, and, and here the older brother has been around all this time, and, you know, dad's never done nothing for me. And then another time, Jesus talks about the person on the road who gets beaten up and robbed and then the priest goes by and doesn't help the Levite goes by and doesn't help 
And you all know the story. Who helps? It's the Samaritan. We mustn't forget that the Samaritans, those, those folks, they were not any good. They lived on the other side of the tracks. They had a checkered past, and we have nothing to do with them. Jesus made that person the hero of the story. And you remember he said at the end to the people who were trying to trap him, he said, you go and do likewise. Now those two stories, the prodigal son and the good Samaritan, they have a lot to say to us that we can just feel good about. We love to see the grace of God in action there and the forgiveness that comes to the prodigal son. We love to see the charity that is shown to that, rob or to that person who is robbed and beaten on the side of the road. Well, that brings us to yet one more parable, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time. This one's from Matthew, and it's in chapter 20, if you'd like to turn there. I don't believe we have this for you. So it's Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Now this parable, we don't get the warm fuzzies for this one in the same way. Because I think that most of us, deep down, have that same sense of expectation that those early workers had. Now I grew up in Indiana. I've lived in Brazil my entire life. And I know something about the work ethic that we have all been raised with and lived with, and probably we live it out in our lives. The worker deserves his or her pay, and you're supposed to get up and go to work in the morning. And that's what these workers were doing. They were there at the place where they could get hired first thing. We'll come back to that this sense of expectation. We all have it. A sense of what's right and what's wrong, of how the day is going to go. You all don't know me very well, but I'm very much a private person and I don't like to like put myself out there. And you might be wondering, well, what's he doing up there? <laughs> but normally I'm over there and I'm sort of behind the music, helping other people get, get a, an experience from the, from the music. But I like to get up in the morning, have time to myself, and I also am a person who exercises. 
So I look at the clock and I figure out just exactly what time I have to go out the door to get to the local YMCA, get on the treadmill, do my thing, get out, come home, and go on with the day. Well, at our local YMCA, there is an employee there, and really, I, I confess, the world is probably a better place because of people like her. We'll call her Sally. Sally is a very friendly person. And every time you see her, she greets you as if you are her very best friend and she hasn't seen you in 10 years. Every single time. Now, when the person that I described a moment ago meets Sally, person's sense of expectations is somewhat violated because now the whole day is going to be slowed down if I have to stop and interact, right? So I try to keep my head down. Sometimes I've got my iPad with me because I'm going to read while I'm on the, the treadmill. I go right to the treadmill. Well, this one morning, I got lucky. She was in the back of the building working at the time that I got there. So I hurried upstairs, got on the treadmill, and I'm reading. I'd been there about 10 minutes. Here she comes, pushing the broom. So I start to think, okay, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll just be ready for her. She comes closer. And I'm still just trying to keep my head in the iPad. And I'm trying to read, but I'm also thinking about, you know, what I'm going to say. And try to be nice, be charming. Here she comes, and she's, she's not saying anything, and so I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder what's going on. And I keep reading, and she's going around this side, and she's going around that side, and I'm, she never says anything. And I'm like, what? What? What did I do to you? What? Why are you attacking me? She never did say anything that morning. But... When I saw her the next time, everything was fine. So I guess that one time, out of the dozens of times that I had interacted with her over the years, she sort of got the hint that I was trying to stay focused. But do you see what that did to me? Those expectations about how things were going to go led me to have this entire conversation with myself, inwardly. And you think that I remember anything that I was trying to read while that whole scene was playing out in my head? At all. The point is, we create those expectations for ourselves. Just like those workers had expectations about how much they were going to get paid. And then when they saw the folks who were hired later get paid the same amount, they thought, hey, we're probably going to get more. And then they were offended when they didn't get more. Think about it. The landowner was right. He had entered into a contract with them that they were going to get paid a certain amount, which was the fair amount for a day's work. They got paid that, but because he paid the others the same way, they were offended. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being offended because someone else gets a windfall? Someone else receives a blessing and you feel well, why didn't I get that blessing? I know none of you folks would feel that way, but I have known some people who might actually have that feeling. I confess, maybe I've had some of those feelings myself. I mean, wasn't it just a few weeks ago that this program was announced by the government that student loans were going to be forgiven? I mean, how did that make you feel? It's like, well, I paid my student loans. How'd it make you feel? Others received a blessing. A blessing they certainly didn't deserve, right? Who are we to say that? And we don't know all the circumstances involving their circumstances. Did we do what we were supposed to do? Yes. 
did we receive the benefit we were supposed to receive? Yeah. Is God good? Absolutely. But the point I'm trying to make is, what's going on inside? What's the reflection that you see when you look into the mirror of God's word? I remember a time, I was in third grade, and our elementary school lived about a couple of blocks from a grocery store. So she's been gone many years, so I'm gonna use her real name. So Miss Newton had us take a walking trip to the grocery store. And we went through the, the different departments. We even went back into the meat room and saw them preparing the hamburger and so forth. And then as we left, the cashiers at the front were passing out little candy bars for all of us. And to this day, and I mean, we're talking 1969, 1970, I still remember when Miss Newton saw that we had all gotten these little candy bars, she said, and it was just like this, oh, I didn't get any. That sticks with a person. Now, you know, I was what, nine? I don't know what was in her heart. Maybe she was just making an offhanded comment, but it hit my nine-year-old brain like, whoa, something's going on there. That's the kind of impact that we can have when we react to situations such as this. Are we envious? because God is generous. So it's a, it's a parable that we have a little trouble with, and I confess I've, I've had a lot of trouble with this parable over the years. This sense of fairness and whether or not I've violated somebody's sense of fairness. I have three kids and eight grandchildren, and you sometimes learn lessons about fairness. Well, you didn't get me that. How come I don't get a cake? I want a toy too. But at least once we grow up, we abandon all that way of reacting to things, don't we? What are your gut reactions? reveal to you about God's indwelling spirit in your heart. Again, taking from contemporary culture, I'm always surprised when I hear people talking about being offended. Sometimes the people who say that they're offended are the ones that I'm like, huh? What are you offended about? A few years ago, this was one that I just couldn't get my brain wrapped around at all. A lot of businesses started saying happy holidays at Christmas time. Because, let's be honest, there are other holidays that people legitimately celebrate other than Christmas. Okay, I'd never really thought about that when I was a kid, but I can say happy holidays. If my saying happy holidays helps another person to feel included in my well wishes, why wouldn't I do that? But somehow that becomes a war on Christmas. Really? <laughs> and, and the people who I see making that complaint, I know it's none of you, the, the, the people that I see making that complaint are like, why are you saying that? There's not a war on Christmas. We're just trying to bring other people in. And after all, if God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, don't we want to make other people feel brought in? Yeah. Now, one that's more recent, and I will confess this one is one that I'm still wrestling with because I think all of the problems that you're going to face in life and you're making a big deal about this, that's kind of how I react to this next issue. So trigger warning, there's something coming. It's, 
the, the idea of, I'll see in, in my students sometimes when they send me an email, their signature line will have pronouns, his, her, him. And I'm like, is, is that really a thing? And I guess that it is. And I am trying to live the grace of God in, in that particular issue, but I'm still kind of processing that out. But again, the point is not whether that thing, that issue, is right or wrong in a certain way. The point we're trying to talk about this morning is, what does that do to us? Does that cause the fruit of the Spirit in our life to spoil a little bit? Because if it does, then that issue is not the problem. We need to be a little more careful in the way that we're tending to that fruit and God's Spirit in our midst. So, again, God's grace is offered freely to all. Who are we to question the deserving nature of other people in, in many different ways? And when we read the parables of Jesus, let's be careful to stand there, to look in that mirror he puts before us and see just what's going on in our own lives so that we might be more representative of who he is to those around us. Amen.
is the first. Pretty cool. I, by the way, that's not two-way glass, or that's two-way glass. You, I can see you, so. Well, it's, there's always a danger. When I prepare communion uh, meditations, I usually uh, kind of wait like a week or two before and see what God lays on my heart. And uh, so this week, uh, I was challenged in preparing for a Sunday school lesson, uh, which is Francis Chan's Crazy Love. If you've read that book, uh, it's pretty impactful. And uh, it just challenged within me the desire uh, to love God, to love God more, not just for his blessings, but really loving him, uh, allowing him to come into my heart and change me, to do his will not my will. It caused me to question about all my desires. David writes in Psalm 63, when he was in the desert of Judah, uh, a very dry and barren place, uh, which definitely influences this psalm. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. Wow, what a beautiful picture of a desire to know and love God. Of course, Bible and prayer are really great ways for deepening our relationship with the Lord. But I think a good first step in developing a deeper desire is the teaching on the Lord's Prayer. And I haven't been here for a month, and I know you finished that up, but uh, there's one section I want to talk about. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I was moved that my prayers are mostly about my will and my kingdom. On earth. You know, prayers for everything I care about and I want God's intervention on, which is certainly okay. Uh, it just falls short of total surrender to God and praying to allow Him to work through me for His will to be done, using me as a servant to bring glory to Him, loving Him, allowing Him to lead me where He wants me to go day by day. A growing desire to want to love him because we see him working in our lives, developing a deeper relationship with him. And this morning, in our self-examination for communion time, in our remembering of Jesus, let's ask ourselves, how is my relationship with Jesus? He certainly wants to be closer to us. There's so much more to walking with Christ than we can possibly imagine. I'm reminded in Revelation 3.20, uh, it's not a passage that's used very often correctly, I think, but uh, Jesus is addressing lukewarm Christians, not unbelievers as many things. He says, here I am. I stand to the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with this person and they with me. How much do I really love him? Do I really want his will in all the areas of my life more than my will? Will I surrender totally? Will I open the door? Let's go to Jesus in the garden before the crucifixion. The pure and blameless Lamb of God that would be very soon falsely accused, beaten and his flesh torn off to the point of death, mocked, spit on, made to carry his own cross, stumbling up to the site where they would put spikes through his hands and his feet, hoist him to the air to die a cruel death. But that was not even the worst of it. All my sins, your sins, and the sins of the world. were placed on him. The separation from God while he was suffering in hell paying for what we deserve. And that was about to happen, and Jesus knew it. In Matthew 26, 39, 
talking about Jesus praying in the garden. It says, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. And then 42, he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And we know the results of this following of the Father's will beyond words. Jesus conquered death and brought salvation to the whole world. And as believers in Christ, Christ in us, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, your will be done in each of our lives. Give us the courage to surrender completely to you and your will. Have your own way with us, just as you designed each of us. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have done, for your great love, mercy, and grace. We hold on to you with all that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. But before the garden, Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. After he had washed their feet. And after the meal, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he gave thanks and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in the remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 